Hi, good morning. Feels like a physics class at college here. About this time, we get together. How about those 8 a.m. classes? Do you remember those? Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Actually, uh, it's nice to have in one day, in one morning, two master classes with four, uh, two big names uh, uh, with us. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, I would like to introduce Sarah Johnson. She will uh, uh, moderate this session. Actually, Sarah Johnson uh, was the head of the jury, uh, international jury for narrative. Uh, she just finished last day her duty as a uh, head of the jury. Thank you again for her. And I leave the uh, floor to you. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, I believe this gentleman to my right doesn't need an introduction. I'm sure everyone has come just to, uh, just to hear what he has to say and, and meet him. And, and I wanted to sort of just start out by, you have a lot of young filmmakers in the audience, and I know they would love to hear kind of how you ended up getting into film and, and sort of what were your struggles at the, at the beginning of your career, and you know, what sort of any advice you'd really like to impart. I, I could go on for 45 minutes and talk about the beginnings and how hard it is. I, I have to find a way to telegraph because I don't know exactly your interest. I know many of you do documentaries, and that's a very good way to, to start this process. <laughs> Although I've come close. Uh, actually, my Putin uh, interviews, which are playing here, you know, have managed to rub the, uh, the liberals the wrong way, but the liberals are wrong on this issue, and big time wrong. And this is a gigantic moment in American history where, again, we see proof that the, the left and the right of pursuing the same agenda of war. Uh, and this is a major issue for me for, in our country, why we continue to be so militarist. Now, uh, and this has been going on as, as we tabled in Untold History of the United States, our 10-part series that was started in World War II and accelerated after World War II. So uh, that's one issue, but uh, you know, in Egypt I know you have Similar situations because you haven't had a military government so often for so long or some version of it. So it's hard to talk to you with any sense of uh, what you can do in Egypt. Uh, so much money is coming to you from the United States in military aid. It's disgusting. It's truly disgusting. And I don't know where all the money goes. I don't know the history and I don't know the specifics. But this is a problem uh, all over the world, not just in Egypt and America all over the world. Uh, I don't know why I went off on that. You asked my roots. Okay. Uh, my roots was I went to war. Actually, I was in war in Vietnam, and I came back, and I was uh, a raised conservative. My father was a Republican, Eisenhower. He was not a madman like they are now. He was a very smart, educated man with to Yale and economics and Wall Street. That's the reason I did Wall Street. My dad... Uh, 30th anniversary of, I believe. Yes, 30th anniversary. It's a movie that was actually... Uh, it was wonderful to make it. Wonderful to make it. And uh, on the, you know what? It went into the zip, guys. But at the time, it was painful because after the heights of Platoon and Salvador, to suddenly be so criticized for making a film which was, by their standards, too much a studio film, and with a, uh, I, but I made the film with pride, and I, enjoy, I always liked it, I knew people liked it, and that was the key, people would come up to me years later and say, you know, I was a young kid, I was studying uh, architecture, or I was studying civil engineering, at blah, blah, and I saw this movie, and then I wanted to go to Wall Street. So, and a lot of them went to Wall Street. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, whether that's good or bad, uh, they all emphasize that they're trying to do it honestly. They all believe that they're trying to do it honestly. You know, but that's the problem. That was the Charlie Sheen problem. Because greed is very subtle, and greed can make you corrupt without recognition, without recognition, without you recognizing it. I was at NYU Film School after Vietnam on the GI Bill, and I made short films, 16 millimeters. I made three. Uh, three of them, very ambitious. Well, we made sm smaller films. Marty Scorsese was one of my teachers, one of the best, energetic, 
making uh, 60 seconds, two minutes, three minutes, short in front of the class, and it, it was it was rough. Uh, it was like a Chinese cultural revolution uh, perspective in the sense that everybody was tearing down the, the system and uh, these films we were they were being criticized openly, and that was the way we did things. So when we had a new project and we wanted money from the from the we needed money from the school to get approval. We'd have to go to the class. We would talk to 20 people, 30 people, and you'd argue your idea. And they, why are you making that? You know, that's a bourgeois idea, or you know, you can't. You know, all kinds of reactions to the subject matter. It was very painful. And then when you finished your film, you showed it. Oh my God! Oh, there would be it would be savage. But in a sense, you learned from the give and the take. Uh, I have to say. Uh, and I ended up making one that was very respected, uh, called Last Year in Vietnam, based on personal feelings. The other two were very abstract, 20-minute short films, 25 minutes, in a, done in a Godard, uh, Bunuel, uh, homage uh, fashion. In other words, I was imitating those people because I, at that time, uh, European filmmaking seemed to be the one that was in the lead. Uh, American films I liked, but uh, we never considered that the same uh, in the same way as Ingrid Igmar Bergman or or Mr. Bunuel or uh, Fellini. Uh, so uh, after film school, it was very hard. Couldn't get a job. Uh, six, seven years. Uh, I wrote screenplays. Was the one thing I did at NYU that was different than most of the young people there who were studying making films. There was this belief at that time that it, you could go ahead and make a film out of thin air. You didn't really need to have a script. Uh, Godard had a lot to do with that, as the French and the French did. But uh, I was always fascinated in writing. I'd written, I had written much uh, since I had been about 15, 16. I had started to write. I wrote. This is a long story, but I wrote a book, which became a book in 1997, and it was called *The Child's Night Dream*. It was published by St. Martin's Press. So I had really gone into this heavy period of writing in 1966 before, and uh, it would, uh, I knew that I had something to express. I just felt like there was a lot inside me that had to come out because I was, my parents had been divorced, I was an only child, there was no outlets, uh, and uh, the, my, the sense of family had evaporated with the divorce. You have to understand that, you know, I was sent to boarding school and then I went right into the, uh, basically the school system at Yale, and then the military, then merchant marine, merchant marine and military. I was a teacher in Vietnam. A lot of little things, a lot of different jobs. And then I ended up a taxi driver in New York on the night shift after I landed, among other jobs, among other jobs, temp jobs, messenger jobs, uh, a sports film company. It was struggle, and I almost gave up. I was reaching 30 years old, and I didn't think I'd ever make it, because I had a couple of breaks. One script almost got made. Robert Bolt was involved. He's a wonderful man, a screenwriter. And uh, he uh, pushed it, but so we couldn't get it made. So, you know, it looked like it was over. And I said, okay, I made a deal. I said, I'd go to 30, and then I'd quit. At 30, it's hard to say no, but I was ready to go and uh, give it up. I was planning some things I wanted to get into, but uh, the irony is that I did have great a twist of luck. Uh, I'd, I'd written a draft of something called Platoon, which was probably of the 10 screenplays, 11 screenplays I'd written in those years. It was probably the closest to, uh, was recognized as very personal and very tough, too tough to make, too downbeat, uh, much too downbeat. Apocalypse was Apocalypse Now, Deer Hunter were being made, so it looked like it was over, and they would never make a, sort of that kind of a realistic film. Then Rambo and Missing in Action, the Chuck Norris films, all that took over, and uh, it was over. So, but the good thing that happened from Platoon was that it gave, got me a film that they wanted to make. They bought this life rights of Billy Hayes, who had been busted, smuggled for smuggling in Turkey, lifetime type sentence, got out, escaped, and they wanted to make his story. Now, this is an interesting little bit, but I wrote the screenplay, and it was uh, very, very light. Uh, it was made, very low budget. Alan Parker became an international success, beyond belief. Really went around the world. That was 1978, 79. The truth was, and I found out 25, 30 years later, it was a Billy Hayes had conned me, 
and was bullshitting me the whole time that he was talking to me. Because he really had never said to, to, to us, to me, or the director, or the producers, that in fact he'd smuggled three times out of Turkey's hash for money before he got busted this fourth time. Uh, we all had the impression this was his first time he was an innocent uh, kid. Many stories like that we learn later, but that's supposed to show you how the life works. It's a little trickier, and one day she, it could become a good play. But he's quite an uh, interesting con man. There are quite a few in life, and especially in the movie business. So that's the beginning. I give you a little a sense of how it wasn't easy. I never gave up, and I got lucky at before 30, just before 30. Yeah, and I think that's something that filmmakers struggle with a lot, is the understanding the length of time it takes in between an idea a script and actually getting a film made. Well, now that we're older, we know that, but when you're 27, right. five years old, I mean, you're in a rush. You want to, why is this not happening? Uh, you were, I was writing low budget stuff, and then I would try high budget stuff. I, would, I was trying to make it myself. I made a, a small film, which was actually kind of a strange experiment called Seizure, it, which we shot very low budget horror film in Canada in 1973. So I was trying everything. There is very low budget. What what sort of range are you? That, in that time, seventy three dollars. We had raised. <laughs> what did you say? That? I was just asking the budget size. Of the, oh, nineteen seventy three dollars. Yeah. Well, you know, whenever we talk budgets in with the young people, they never understand that. Uh, they always say, "How can you spend that much money?" But it's, believe me, uh, you, you you spend money on on the normal things, and in those days, camera. There was no the video type technical services that you have. You couldn't shoot with a small camera like you're doing now. Uh, it was, and lighting was complicated. Anyway, that cost film too. was budgeted at about $160,000. I don't think we ever saw that amount of money. It was, uh, we ended up actually being cash by making it for 80 and lying our way through the rest. Uh, we were hunted down by the, the Canadian Mounties. It was all kinds of problems. And actually, the producer, there was a warrant for his arrest. There was issues all the way through that film. And, uh, but it was a learning experience. Um, I'm giving you a taste of it. I know it's terrific. Detail. Can you talk a little bit about what film you sort of feel um, most proud of? Or, you know? <laughs> no, I don't, I don't, I'm always asking, you know, what's your favorite? No, each one is a pro each one existed for me as if I was in love and that was my wife uh, for that year and a half or two. That was my life. It was, uh, I would, I would, if anything, I was perhaps overly devoted uh, and I think sometimes my kids did not have, did not spend as much time. I, to me, to spend time with your kid or a movie, a movie is much more interesting. <laughs> You know, like stay at home dad, I appreciate all that stuff, but it doesn't work for me. <laughs> I had done that as a kid, but I didn't want to repeat it. I, anyway, I lost my turtle. Uh, I, had, uh, I had all kinds of animals, but my turtle disappeared from the wall, and I looked for it for a long time. And one day I was saying, this turtle is still on the wall, it's like an Edgar Allan Poe story, and I devised a story about the, the turtle that comes back. Uh, from the dead. Like a horror movie. I would do it. AIP used to be around, and then uh, you remember AIP, Sam Arkoff? He turned me down three times, uh, and you know, I struggled. Joe Sugar gave me a break on that film. They, they, he distributed it. Joe Sugar of Cinerama. He would know, would remember some of these characters. What about the film you struggled the most with? It sounds like maybe this one made in Canada might be. No, I think my life is a very interesting curve, really up, down, up, down. Uh, I can't say I, I never got higher uh, in the public uh, spirit than uh, Platoon and Salvador. Platoon especially, they, because people didn't have a, sh a definition of me. I was a soldier. I've been a veteran. I did the story. Red badge of courage, whatever you want to call it, this was it. I should have stopped then, probably, but I had no intention to because I'd always wanted to be a filmmaker. And I only saw it as a vehicle to make more films and to learn because I didn't know as much as I wanted to know. So by making films like Wall Street Followed, that was the next film, right away, that was a real studio film with a real budget in New York City. And I really went to, uh, I learned an enormous amount. Then one thing followed another, talk radio, very complicated inner, inner studio. 
uh, all shot in 30, 35 days, complicated the unbelief, lenses, diopters, mirror effects. It was beautifully done. Uh, Bob Richardson, I, I found as a cameraman, so we developed uh, together. We were ready after talk radio. We trusted ourselves enough, and I say that, because these are big projects, they get bigger, and you can't, un you can't go there right away. There's no way. So we went uh, from there into Born on the Fourth of July, which was a gigantic film, much bigger than Platoon, about a, three periods in American history, the 1950s, the Vietnam War, and the return in the 1970s from, uh, from the war. Three big periods, three different setups, lighting, mood, atmosphere, we conceptualized it. We, you know, how do you shoot a paraplegic in a in a wheelchair, especially in anamorphic? You have to understand. We were, for the, for us, we were the first time we shot two three five was this film, and oddly enough, he's in a wheelchair, so you you're expanding the lens. My producer didn't want to do it. Uh, he was a cheap Chinaman, but uh, he really he said, "Oh, you know, you got to put more fucking extras in set." You gotta put, you gotta put more costumes. It's gonna cost you. You gotta build a bank to fill the frame. You know, this is their concern. But it was a wonderful experience. Hard, very hard. Uh, so, but it was, and it was well received and made was a solid money maker for many years. And uh, but as to what you asked, the arc of my life in film has been very weird, up down, up down, and uh, ten films in ten years, all of them accomplished to some degree, all of them. And, uh, you know, my attitude is, fuck you. You know, like, this is, no one's going to give me a break. No one's going to give me a break. I might as well, this is the last film I'll ever do, so you might as well do it. Uh, after those 10 years, it gets, you know, I don't want to get into psychology, but it's very complicated. I should write a book about that period, but there's complications that go on. And the business is what it is, uh, and it always feeds back to you in a strange way. Now, where am I? I did more and more documentaries. Uh, I did, well, making JFK was a watermark in the sense if I crossed the Rubicon. After that, I couldn't go back. To, I, they thought they knew who I was, but they never did. They, they thought they knew. JFK was the uh, end of any con concept of a unified public personality. You know, you know what I'm trying to say? It was, you can never be. Uh, always, every time something would come out, there'd, have, there'd be an old grind. And some, uh, somebody would feel, you know, that they knew the answer and that I had imposed the answer on them. That's yeah. not true. I questioned, the, I questioned the results of the war. There's a lot of criticism for that. Yeah, you know, but it was an amazing film for me. Right. I learned enormous amount. And we did it in a, in a right. very muscular, compact way. For, you know, at three hours and ten minutes, there's a lot of uh, film in there. So after that period, there was a 2000 period, and uh, you know some people say I lost my touch and all that stuff. I keep hearing that. You know that's a categorization that doesn't help at all because every film is different. Every single film I can tell you about, from beginning to end, they matter to me. Every single one, from a U-turn to uh, to uh, what was it? Uh, Snowden was the most difficult mother mother. Uh, <laughs> I went to Moscow. Uh, nine times uh, to meet with Ed just to, because we wanted to tell the story accurately and this is a new world to me, this computer world uh, uh, and uh, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I learned a lot but at the same time how do you render it into film because it's so, so the computer world is to a degree abstract, it's not linear or visual or concrete so it's, it is difficult but we were dealing with cyber warfare and we visualize it in, in linear terms, it's true but we have to. But we worked very hard to get it right, and I think the film was, I am very proud of it, I think it was underrated. We, we had a big problem that no American studio would touch it. That was very disappointing to me, personally. It was not one of many disappointments that pile on, but American studios have, I thought, an obligation to make a film about this fellow because he's important to us, very important. And he told us things we didn't know that the, our government was doing, but no interest at all. Why do you think that is? Um, I, think, uh, I think people got scared after 9-11. I think they've been super falsely patriotic. And I think that there's a, a, a sense of... Uh, uh, I, I won't, McCarthyism has always been in the American life. You know, not just to, to do something that is, could be considered anti-American. You know, 
this concept, which is itself a corrupt terminology. To use the word anti-American is to imply, you know, it is a form of groupthink. You have to think like this. And I, being a guy who never liked thought control, I was not. A, I was in the army, but I really resisted, uh, resisted uh, what the U.S. Army was doing in Vietnam at that time. In my head, my way. But, uh, I don't go well with authority. I understand the need for police and all that. And I'm, you know, it's an argument, but it's always there. Always. But as filmmakers, we're supposed to challenge the status quo and supposed to ask questions and, and bring to light, you know, issues that that may be a little bit opaque. And I'm I'm surprised to hear that no studios would touch that. Because no, you are. That's really you sad. It, it makes script sense. was good. We had uh, two young actors, and they liked the actors. It was. And uh, it was doable, it was reasonable. My producer wanted to shoot it in Germany, he's German, and he said, I just don't feel comfortable shooting it in the States. And we made Munich match uh, the US, and we shot three scenes in the US. We came back, this was great, we came back to the uh, US for our first scene in Washington, D.C., and our first scene called us for us to be outside the White House. And we got permission, because they will give you permission, and we were looking right at the White House, and I'm sure Obama, who, as you know, was uh, one of the, he's pursued every whistleblower. I mean, he brought espionage uh, case, espionage act cases against him. He's been the worst on, uh, on uh, sharing information, one of the worst we've ever had. And he really uh, hated Snowden, he expressed that, and it was, it's in the film too. But uh, him and Julian Assange were the, uh, and, Ch and Chelsea Manning, so those people, uh, anyway, he came out of the White House one, at one time with the, with a car, and we had to suspend a shooting. But I love getting my like, a sense of you know fuck you. you know, this, is, this is the guy. This is the guy who called the punk. Uh, you know, and we're making you know, the, his film, his life story outside the White House, and it's going to be a lot better than yours, Barry. Uh, but uh, they were, they were, they, we we ended up. Oh, I want to finish the story. We. The point is, you get fucked in the end anyway. So, we uh, finished the film. And very difficult. Money, cash, I won't even go all those. Ones. We did not have, uh, you see, if we'd gotten the support of a studio, American studio, we would have been able to really have a, a success. No question, because the polling showed that Snowden was much more popular in Europe than he was in the United States. It was a remarkable difference. That was our base. So uh, we made a small, we had to make a small deal with uh, an American distributor, Open Road, which is a good distributor, their, their quality, and, but they just don't have the reach, the clout, the ability to stay in theaters, the ability to get a film out, advertising and so on. And the film, then, and above all, they did not want to go with the, uh, the French and Germans wanted to go to uh, Cannes, which we were invited to, they were very enthusiastic, that's where we should open the film. That's where it belonged. But they said, no, we will, we, we will open the U.S. first. That was their right. They put up the, le the least amount of money, and they had that, that right. And I think that was part of it. We made $25 million in the U.S., which is about, which is not great. It just, it's been very, the, the, the whole distribution uh, system has changed so much in the last 20 years. Oh, you years. would know. Yeah, yeah, we're in the middle really, of it. It's, really, it's almost impossible to get a good distribution in P&A money. Nobody wants to put Tarat it Tarat Benamar, who invited me here, is, you know, said to me yesterday, it is so impossible with independent distribution anymore. Yeah. And, and, to get it through. And the studios are not doing a lot of films in the U.S. And, you know, the studios so are making films, but they're making a certain kind of film right. that would be kind of a guaranteed... Right. Uh, I mean, from, from my point of view, from the 1970s, when it's a disaster. I mean, you, you have so much limited the choice. But you see what their cowardice is about anything that's questionable about America. You can make a film where you kill a lot of uh, terrorists. You can make a film where you, you and the enemy is, can be Russian, or he can be uh, uh, in any form of villain. But it, it has to be a subtle. American military has been worshipped in films, and there's a whole list of them you can go through. And it makes money. Clint Eastwood proved you could with Sniper. Mark Wahlberg proved you could. But these films have become gone far more to the right. Uh, well, I can't say that because there were some propaganda films in World War II, but far more to the right than we've ever seen. It's uh, to an NYU graduate, film graduate who came out in the 70s, 
who thought that the world was going to change after Vietnam, that people had learned this great lesson. It's stunning, the reversal of the Reagan revolution. Uh, Ronald Reagan in 1980 just started a trend where everything moved to the right, including the Democrats. The, uh, the other sort of issue that I've noticed uh, with the, um, in the U.S. specifically are the numbers of people going to the theater. And I think last summer was one of the worst. Uh, you know, they, I have 25-year-old twins, and I don't think they go ever. I, I don't remember a time they went to the theater. They watched. I'm an the idealist. I mean, you took. I would like to believe you make a good film. They will come, like Kevin yeah. Costner said. Or Berlin, I don't know who said it in the film. The point is, I think a film can play in a theater. I still do, because there's so many good theaters in the world, and I think it should yeah, be in a theater. Back. And not bring them back. They're there. They will come out. They, they do come out. Uh, the, the problem is, we have so many films per week, unfortunately. Many, uh, it's good for you in a sense, but then you, you make your film for $10, and you can't. You can't get it seen or distributed except maybe once at a museum or something, so, or a festival. So it is frustrating on both sides. The technology allows you a lot more freedom, a lot more freedom, right. with, to do more with less. And at the same time, it's cheapened the image, it's generated. The concept of an image, which is so beautiful if you see it in a pristine condition in the theater, is now everywhere. On television, constant uh, sensationalism. Television is well done. The editing on the commercials and, the, and, and the, uh, most of the shows is stupendous. Sports, for example, stupendous. However, and by the way, they took a lot of things from any given Sunday. That's another story if you're about sports people. But ESPN, they are not, oh, thank you. Uh, I'm saying the image has been so technically well done that people just have grown used to it and stale to it. So, how do you surprise? I mean, if I made a natural born killers today, it would be, it would be one, of, one of the, uh, it would be a standard type of I mean, cutting, I think. You know, no surprises, but when I made it, it sure was a shock. I mean, a shock, uh, 3,800 or so cuts, never been done that way before. So, uh, I go back to a simple story. I'm very simple now. Uh, my narrative is get it told, uh, communicate, always communicate, go back to the writing, stick with the writing, stick with, be humble in that sense, and try to get the thought across. Make your story about something you care about, but try to make it fresh as much as you can. And you can't even see all the films about <laughs> that are out there, so it's very difficult to know that something Somebody tells you, well, I've seen that film before. I'm like, God, you know, how would you know? You know, you saw it somewhere but in Hungary. And by the way, the international films are much more distributed now than ever before, which is a good thing. I love, personally, Korean films and, uh, and Asian films, and I find them much more available than they ever were when I was young. So as a film viewer, it's never been better. At the same time, as a well, filmmaker. Well, there, I think there are a lot of more um, buyers of documentary film as well, which, you know, when I first started oh. doing documentaries, there were three or four buyers, now you have... You couldn't get arrested right. to make a documentary. <laughs> At NYU, uh, many of our class went off in that direction. You know, in that time, it was to make a film about tunnel workers, about unions, you know, always uh, protesting the system, Nixon. Uh, NYU got, we got a crew busted doing the Wall Street protests with Nixon. It was very interesting and we lost two cameras that day, which <coughs> wiped out the film school pretty much. But uh, George Stoney was, became the head, so uh, George Stoney was a documentarian going way back. And he was, they always, NYU always had the documentary tradition. In fact, Flaherty's films were the first ones we saw in, in our classes, uh, Robert Flaherty. Nanook of the North, I believe, you, you know what I'm talking about. That was the original documentary, one of. So it's a whole, it's really, for a documentary, it's great. Uh, I mean, it, it's uh, taken very uh, seriously. So I think there are a lot of people in the audience who would really love to ask some questions of you, if you don't mind. Um, thought we uh, would open it up to uh, the full audience here, so I don't know how. You want to, David? Okay, as long as you brought up Any Given Sunday, which was a tremendous editing job and lots of other things, 
What do you think of what's happening in the National Football League today? Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, I I peaked out I peaked out on football about that time. Uh, I had tremendous fights with the NFL. Uh, they would not condone our movie at all, as you can as you can see. In fact, we had to change all the uniforms, all the uh, names, the teams. Uh, they were nasty, really nasty. Uh, in fact, they went after us and tried to. When we were starting to shoot, they went to all the stadiums because there's only so many stadiums in the world and tried to cut us out. We needed stadiums, so. Ironically, uh, there were some uh, owners of the teams that hated the NFL, which was good. They did, because they, didn't fight, they, they fight among themselves. Jerry Jones happened to be one of them. So he gave us to Dallas, which is an amazing, amazing stadium for the climactic game. And guess who the uh, pretty conservative, the Miami Dolphins guy who ran Black, who owned Blockbuster. You remember what I'm talking about? What? Yeah, it was Wayne Wazenga, was terrific. He gave us, and the Orange Bowl was a college stadium. We fought to death. we fought very hard. They tried to get the University of Florida to back out, but we held on to it. So we had three stadiums for five games, which was quite a victory for us. But they went further than that. When the film was released, you know, I, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm giving facts. I mean, if you go back in the computer and you say. You remember ESPN was the hottest number in sports at that time, and uh, we did not get any coverage, basically, on anything in the sports related world because the, the NFL is so strong that they could say, listen, we don't want you to help cooperate in any way with this film. And uh, we never saw, except for one or two uh, iconic uh, broadcasters, you wouldn't know their names, uh, we never really got a sports attention, which hurt us. We did very well in spite of that. But today, I noticed right away, uh, you know, we used the rap score for a lot of the stuff. They'd never used rap before in the, in, in the NFL. It was after that film that you'll see the rap starting to come in. And the music changed, the cutting changed. They, they stole a lot from, from our film. Uh, but it was a sexy film, made the NFL exciting. Uh, but they just continued to make money. But the game has degenerated to a degree to me. I always feel like Baseball is much more interesting because it's scientific in a way, but they talk about analytics in, in football, but it's, if you really listen and study it, it comes down ultimately to violence to a certain degree. You have to hit the other guy harder. And there is that, and so there is always, there is science, but it's always force too. And I feel that, that that makes the games less interesting. Concussions, I don't know about that, but yes, it seems to me. What about the players feeling during the national anthem? Oh. Yeah, I don't know what to say about that. You know, I, my issue with the United States is much bigger than that. It goes to uh, the race. It really is. It's about militarism and war and survival of the planet. So that's a big issue. Last, nobody cares it seems. I mean, we passed a seven hundred billion dollar defense appropriations bill. We gave the right to war again back to the president. McCain is behind. John McCain is happy in spite of the brain cancer. Seven hundred billion dollars. Nobody even spends close to that. Why do we always spend that? And then we send five hundred million to Ukraine out of that. Five hundred million weapons to Ukraine, which is insane. You're putting they're stirring the fire all the time on the eastern borders of Russia. They're surrounding China as best they can. They're fighting, they're reforming, they're they're rebuilding the nuclear uh, their nuclear force, which is a gigantic mistake. Gigantic mistake. We should really sign the non proliferation treaty. We should be the leaders morally in putting the stop to this race. We have to accept that North Korea has weapons. We have to. There's no choice. So these things, we're not being mature in our nuclear policy. And this is the greatest threat. Much more important to me than I hate the cop, what the cops are doing, but I, each case is different. So, uh, I sense another film. Group. I think we have a question. Hi, uh, my name is Charlotte Carroll. Um, uh, I've just directed my first short film, and you mentioned the animal foot lenses, and that's what I shot on. And now my next project is going to be a documentary, and I was wondering if you had any do's and don'ts about equipment and lenses to shoot the documentary with. Uh, I couldn't hear. What, what did you shoot on? I shot on anamorphic lenses. Anamorphic? Yeah. Oh, what was the reason? Uh, just because my film has no dialogue because of the children going through so much trauma, uh, the picture is its only voice, and it has to be really beautiful 
and that's why I chose this. Well, I, I, you know, to me, documentary should, I, I wouldn't put money into that, but you have your reasons. I would have, you know, I'd save it for the other things you need. Uh, get the information across. I've never gone to documentaries for beauty. I've always gone to them more to, for the structure and the learning process. It's quite a choice. I can't tell you what to use because the, the equipment changes on a monthly basis. You know, we used uh, an Alexa, I think, in uh, our most recent film, the Putin interviews. But uh, no, I'm, I wouldn't be the right person to talk about that. Hello, Zainab Amir, uh, spoken Carol. I would like to know uh, the image that you had in mind about Mr. Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin before the interviews. And what do you have in mind right now, just the image of him, uh, right now sitting on that stage? What's the difference? Uh, you're talking about... Has it changed? Before. The image of Mr. Vladimir Vladimirovich. I made a documentary called, I'll just give it a little context. There was a documentary released in 2014. Tremendous amount of work I put into the untold history of the United States, was, which I recommend. I hope it gets into the Arabic world. It's on Netflix. You can see it. Uh, it was distributed uh, by Showtime and then by Warner Brothers. So it's gotten, I've gotten it out there as best as I can. Uh, and uh, in that series, it goes from uh, 1890 to about 2013, when we leave it, uh, we'll see the U.S.-Russia relationship through those years. And it, it's, it speaks everything. It says quite a lot that I did not know. Uh, first of all, that you know, the United States was totally against the Russian Revolution and sent troops to Siberia in 1919 to counter-revolution. was part of a very bloody war. The civil war in Russia was very bloody. And Sixteen nations participated in trying to destroy that revolution because <laughs> they were scared of communism, they were scared of the communal, the people taking over. And so it was a people's revolution in that sense. It may have changed over the years, but still, there was a bad... Until Franklin Roosevelt in 1933, we never recognized Russia. Never. Roosevelt had a wide vision of the world. And he said very clearly, on more than one occasion, that after the war, World War II, there would be a grand alliance between Russia, the United States, uh, China, and Great Britain. The idea was they would basically create a United Nations type thing, and they would be the four powers that were the most dominant, which is a very generous vision. Uh, but Mr. Roosevelt unfortunately died at the wrong time. He died in April of 45. If he had lived till August or September of 45, there would be a whole different world now, I believe. And that's what our documentary shows. One of the things that people in America and maybe Europe don't realize is the, uh, you, the USSR is the difference in World War II. Uh, they, and five of every six German soldiers uh, were killed by the, by the uh, Russians. And the resistance of the Russians to the Germans is what broke the back of Hitler in 1942-3 the uh, siege at uh, Leningrad and then the, the tremendous, the greatest battle of all time was at Stalingrad, probably the bloodiest and then cursed right after. And the Russians chased the Germans out. They killed more Germans than any single person. Without the Russians fighting that war, my father, your fathers, well, I don't know how many of you were American or English but, or European, but many of our fathers would not have made it. We would be in a much bloodier war. The United States came in late. And they promised the second front, they came in very late. And D-Day, as much as it's pictured in movies as a great battle, it was a great maritime expedition and a battle. But casualties were minimum compared to what happened in the Russian front. So uh, this, the, Russia, the, the German war machine, as Churchill said, was broken. The spine of it was broken by Russia. We never took that into account. We, had, we behaved like barbarously from day one. Uh, we dropped uh, two nuclear weapons, uh, two, two atomic weapons on Japan right away, with, and there was no need to. Everything we showed in that documentary, and I think many people would agree, not all, was that the war was over with Japan. It was done to show into the day Russia. Uh, so you have to take that into account when you deal with this U.S.-Russia relationship. Mr. Putin is who he is. He is a man who took over 
after the uh, communist revolution, he's not a communist at all, he's condemned uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the market economy guy. But after he took over in 2000, and there's a whole lead up to this, he took over at a time when Russia was in peril. Uh, Yeltsin had, was a, had been president for nine years and had, it was a disaster from 1991 to 2000 in Russia. Uh, people were set back generations in terms of uh, the older people were dying off, the pensions were cut, there was no stability, there was no state. The United States was very happy about that. We were privatizing the hell out of everything we could in Russia. All the oligarchs come from that period. They took over these industries. Putin was, did not ban the oligarchs, he made deals. He, he peeled it back that there was now a respect for government which had been lost. So from 2000 to 2006, he built a mandate, a strong mandate, uh, from, and he was very popular. He's always been popular. He won the 2000, he won 2004 at that time, or six, I forgot, and then he won 2016, uh, which is, was his third term as president. Uh, 2000, excuse me, 2012, I was thinking of the U.S. election. He won 2012 uh, in an election which uh, he, he, he won. I mean, he was clearly the most popular candidate. Uh, the United States did interfere with that election extensively. The United States also interfered in the 1996 election of Yeltsin to President. Yeltsin was a, 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 an alcoholic man. Uh, he was handsome, but Clinton, Clinton and him used to backslap each other. But uh, the, the 1996 election was extremely fraudulent. He would not have won. It was unpopular because of his policies. And, uh, we put him in. We also, the IMF arranged a loan at the last second. All this shit goes on. I mean, this is basically what you learn in life. I've learned a lot from listening to him. How the Americans work. Very subtly, PR. I heard, I, lear I learned about the Ukraine, about how the United States pulled off this coup, and, and the dishonesty of uh, their approach and their treaties to, uh, to, to Russia. I learned about the expansion of NATO, of course, we know about that, but I didn't understand the details of it. The nuclear, uh, the anti-ballistic missile treaty was abrogated. I don't want to go on too much, but, but anti-ballistic missile treaty, that is so important. It is, they've changed, the Americans have changed the balance of power. It used to be a mutual uh, nuclear. It's very dangerous now because we are modernizing, as I said earlier, and we, put, we have weapons right on their border. It's a very scary situation in terms of an accident can happen and there's less time to fix it. And I don't know if there'd be intention. I don't, the United States, neoconservatives, I'm not, is, is honestly thinking that we can have a first strike, a limited first strike on Russia. I they really think that. I don't mean to interrupt, but I, we have a couple more questions. Yeah, I'm sorry, but can I <laughs> drag you to it? I'm afraid we only have time for two more questions. I respect Mr. Putin. I, I respect, respect Mr. Putin. But I understand the criticisms of him, and I don't know all the... I don't live there, but a lot of the, the, the picture of him has been far harsher. But more important is, what is the United States doing? Let's, let, let's forget all this Putin. I love Putin, I hate Putin, all argument. This is much bigger than that. What is the United States doing? Not just in Russia. What is it doing in China? What's it doing in the world? What's it doing in space? This is what you have to ask yourself. We do it very quietly, but we're doing it. Uh, so, I'm a huge fan of your work and also went to NYU as, as you did. And as you said, you, you find yourself having to you know, tell stories of the, challenging the mythology of the time of Vietnam, and many of us have found ourselves having to tell stories to challenge the mythology of America post 9 11 and the war on terror. And so, my question to you is being, you know, since you're so fascinated with American militarism, and you are in the Middle East, which is arguably the epicenter of American militarism, and your films have always challenged the mythology and the narrative, when are you going to make the Middle East film? When are you going to challenge the mythology here? And if you were to, who would you want to talk to? What are the untold stories in your perspective in this part of the world that speak to you? You've spoken with Chavez, you've interviewed with Putin. Who do you want to talk to here? By the way, Karim is the producer of The Square. Oh, are you? Yeah, yeah I think Assad, is still, among others, deserves a recalibration. I think that the picture drawn of him in the West is contributed to this mess. Uh, Assad is interesting, but you know, they all, there, there are so many people that are, this is a very complex story, a complex question, 
your own Egyptian uh, story is amazing. I can't tell all these stories, it's not my job. I mean, these are documentaries you've done. I can't keep up. Uh, the many story, if you look at Putin interviews, he does talk about uh, the Russian involvement in the Middle East, and he talks about more broadly about his policies and what he thinks the Middle East will happen, and he's very optimistic, much more so than I thought. Uh, the, uh, the Iraq uh, and Afghanistan's, Afghan story, from the American point of view, has been frankly uh, depressing to me because they don't deal with the overall, for example, uh, the Academy Award winner, Hurt Locker. It's, you know, tension, there's a lot of tension, but what are they really, is, is there any feeling for the American invasion of Iraq? This is a disaster, and this is a tragedy on the, on the level of, if Tolstoy was around and War and Peace had to be written, this would be about that. The United States made a huge error. George Bush is responsible. Don't give me shit about Donald Trump. Go back to George Bush. Let's stay with the original villain here. And Mr. Cheney, of course. So that, that's a, And I did that with W, if you remember, a little bit. I touched, because for me, Bush's uh, life was finished when he went into Iraq. The Iraq invasion continues to be... America does not have the ability to reflect. They, they don't want to. You can't make any money making a film like that. You don't have to make a documentary. You know, I don't know how to make a film. Green Zone tried. They tried all over the place. Didn't make a dime. So how do you get there? Um, I believe we have one more question up here. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, the square. Uh, yeah. about the, the impact on it. But what do you do? To you, I'm asking you. You're you're a documentarian. Producer, the director. Yeah. You're asking me what question? Yeah. We should let him speak because if he has the answer, this is what this forum is about. We should go further. You don't have to cut it off, do you? Can we go a little bit longer, Nora? I, mean, I, I don't. I don't presume to have the answer of the story that's to be told, but I think that the stories that need to be told are stories that that continue to awaken us, that, that challenge power, as you've done in your career, that aren't scared of the surveillance state, that are, aren't willing to be censored, and that are continuing to inspire audiences to, uh, to feel in a different way. And I think in the context of what we're talking about, I think that we have to look at the legacy of the longest running war in American history and look at how it's, it's pillaged this part of the world and how every single person in this region is shaped by the decisions post 9-11, you know? Every single person in this region is shaped by this war, this endless war on terror. And every single person in this region is haunted by it. Whether you live here or if you live in the United States. If you live in the United States as a Muslim American, you're, you're, you're labeled, you're, 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 you're put into a corner, your story has been told for you, you don't have the right to exist as a person. So I think we need to, we need to... I wouldn't go that far. I mean, no, I wouldn't go that far. You have a right to exist. Okay, you have a right to exist, but your identity has been hijacked from you. And so I think that we need to tell stories that, that challenge those narratives. We need to... I don't think, I don't... On that issue of the U.S., that's an interesting story, but I don't, I don't... I think that the, the Muslim population of the U.S. has been very... It, it, there, it seems like... There was a time, in that 2003-04, when there was, a, there was a lot of activity, a lot of surveillance. It seems to have calmed down in terms of that issue. I may be wrong, it might be going on. But the, uh, it seems that the U.S. handled that pretty well, their own story. And what is the problem is the U.S. Is, doesn't care as much abroad, because they really, they, they can do a PR campaign. What they did in Syria is still not known to most of the American public. You see, there were, the Syria thing is, they were very, they killed a lot of people. And they killed a lot of people taking Raqqa. They, took, they did, and Mosul. These are stories also of our approach to, uh, to warfare. We don't want to take casualties. We're quite willing to do collateral damage. And we did quite a bit of it. So, you know, I, I think we're much more cognizant of what happens in the U.S. We protect everybody in the U.S. We can. Obama is the great face for that. You know, he comes out, I love everybody, you know, he's a multicultural face. Well, meanwhile, he's droning everybody he can, and he's expanding the war on, on, uh, on surveillance and so forth and so on. Uh, the drone attacks themselves, how do you start this thing? Where do you go to make a movie like this? 
uh, it is a Tolstoy type. It changed the world. Two thousand one. It changed the world. And you have been. You you pointed to the. You have been the the victims of it here. But we all have. We all have because in our country we ran away from it. Fear has pervaded the mentality, and it screws us up. All right. So last question, I'm afraid. question is actually about uh, Papun. I know it's, um, it's kind of uh, inspired from your story uh, when you went to fight in, um, in Vietnam. So uh, did you, how close it's to your personal story, your experience? And uh, did you really volunteer going to fight in, in Vietnam? And the other question is about uh, the directing. Is you decided to not show the other enemy, like it's, it was always like showing the, the platoon itself. So did you decide that because this is the vision you wanted to show about like how scary it is or like, or it's it's a kind of a budget thing, you didn't want to go to this? Fight. No, no, I, you I recognize that we had limited funds to make the movie, it was my second, my third movie. Uh, it, it was based on my own story, yes. I did 15 months in the field in four different, three different combat units. Uh, so I moved around, I saw different people. Oh, I didn't, I did volunteer for the draft. In other words, I didn't want to go in the army as a life occupation. I wanted to go to Vietnam as quickly as I could because I wanted to experience war. Not, you think I'm crazy, but I, at that time in my life, having grown up on war movies and very comics and books, promoted this idea of uh, adventure and war and machoism. I did grow up that way. Uh, so I wanted to see the real thing. But I wanted to see it from the ground up, uh, ground level. I didn't want to be an officer. I could have gotten in. I, I didn't want to be responsible. I wanted to see it from a, a taxi driver point of view, uh, which I did. And, uh, and, and I'm glad I did. In, in retrospect, I'm glad I survived. But uh, it was a very, 67, 8 was a pivotal time. So I saw the degeneration of the American mentality in fighting. I think it was there probably from the beginning, but we were not counting, there were, was it Tommy Frank said, we don't do body counts? Uh, we were gathering intelligence in the field, we would find enormous stuff. I don't know what the hell they did with it because they never got anything right back there. In other words, our strategy was pretty... Oh, Oliver, I have to cut you off. Uh, my what? apologies, uh, it's your friend Tarek right here. Uh, Why? I want to, well, because it's called time organization. That's what Professor. Why? Is somebody coming in here? Yes, somebody's coming in. Oh, well, okay. Jesus Christ. I, I'm sorry. Uh, no, no, Oliver. I screwed up with the Russian point. But you, you, I just got No, no, you did great. I wanted to thank Oliver, as your fan and friend and as an Arab producer, I want to thank you to come to an Arab film festival. In today's. As an American who's had the courage to criticize his country, we have to criticize ours. And you said that the Americans spent $700 billion in armament. When I was at the Abu Dhabi Film Festival as a guest, <coughs> the Arab world was spending $470 billion in armament. Now you tell me, if there's a young filmmaker in the room here who wants to make a movie, what does he care whether we have the tallest buildings in Dubai or Riyadh or Abu Dhabi? I told the sheikhs of these countries, because I can speak to them in Arabic, give us one building, $200 million building, we can make 50 Arab movies. And maybe out of those movies, one or two geniuses, guess what? They didn't give me the building. That's what I have to say about Arab money not going into culture. But Guna is trying to make that change, and you know there's no other Arab festival at all. And I'm not a Jew. So okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.